Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining this Invest Engine webinar in partnership with X Trackers on how to beat your bank's rate using ETFs. My name is Andrew Prosser. I'm the head of investments at Invest Engine, and I'm joined today by Toby Dudley Smith, who's the head of X Tracker Sales in the UK, and Hanin Saki, who's a passive product specialist, also X Trackers. Now, in terms of the plan for the webinar, uh, I'm going to hand over to Toby and Hanin in a second, and they're going to go through the main presentation. Uh, on beating your bank using ETS. That should last about 30 minutes. Uh, then I'll give a quick demo on how to buy the ETFs that they've been talking about on the Invest Engine platform. Uh, and then we should have about five to 10 minutes-ish at the end for Q&A. So if you do want to ask questions as we're going through the presentation, uh, you can click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, the questions are not going to be broadcast to the whole webinar chat. Uh, they're just going to come straight to us. So don't worry. Or if you think you've got a stupid question, that's absolutely fine. Don't worry about it. Just feel free to ask away uh, and we'll answer as many as we can at the end. Uh, so if we could go to the first slide, please. Oh, yes, this is the usual disclaimer uh, that your capital is at risk whenever you invest. Uh, this for UK clients only and that none of this is financial advice. So with that, I'm going to hand over to Toby and Hanin to start us off with an intro into who X trackers are. Uh, and then maybe you can explain a little bit about why now is an interesting time to start looking at these cash-like ETFs. All right, thanks, Andy, and uh, good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Um, and appreciate you taking the time to listen to us. I know there's a lot of temptations at the moment with the sun blazing away, euros uh, under all way as well. So yeah, really appreciate it. So my name is Toby Dudley Smith. I'm head of coverage at X Trackers. Um, maybe just give you a little bit of sort of background and. In terms of, of who we are and what we do. So we are part of uh, DWS. DWS was formerly Deutsche Asset Management. We IPO'd in 2018 and became a uh, separate publicly listed company. We, one of the largest asset managers in Europe, we manage just shy of um, uh, a trillion in terms of assets under management across our three core pillars, uh, active, passive, and alternatives. We have a 60 year track record um, in, in active management and, and 20 years in passive management. So um, we've been in this game a long time. Myself and Hanin sit within the Extractors team. So this is the, the ETF unit, shall we say, sitting within DWS. Um, we are the third largest ETF provider in Europe. Um, we launched our first passive product back in the early 2000s. And um, yeah, today, we manage just under 280 billion in, in, in assets under management. In terms of the scale of our offering, it's fairly large. We track over 300 benchmarks across uh, all asset classes, ranging from developed markets, EM equities, uh, regional, uh, country exposures, um, sectors. We offer products in IT, healthcare, uh, factors, so value, uh, MinVol, and even thematic solutions. Um, uh, with products such as AI, which is obviously um, very topical at the moment. We also have a pretty comprehensive fixed income range as well, uh, offering solutions in government bonds, corporates, high yield uh, and inflation linked products as well. As well as fixed income and equity, we also offer commodity solutions and precious metals and broad commodities. So we like to think that kind of we, we're a bit of a fun supermarket, shall we say, um, offering solutions across all asset classes. And we like to think whatever exposure or whatever view you're looking to ex express as an investor, we do have a, a product for you out there. So with that, um, as in the intro, uh, Hanin, I'll, I'll pass it on to you to speak a little bit more. Thank you, Toby. Um, so I guess it's, we want to kick off by looking at why is, it, why is now an interesting time to look at cash. Um, that's the topic of the webinar. Um, but first, we thought it'd be a good idea to step back um, and have a look at what's happening in the overall market. Um, so if we have a look, uh, we can see that US and global equities have really dominated. What we're seeing is these risk assets have performed very well. Um, US equities in particular up 15%. That's on a year-to-date basis. Um, so we're really seeing an equity rally at the moment. Um, and that's on the next slide, if you can put there. The, the slide up there. Yeah, so we're seeing equity uh, really rally at the at the moment, up 15%. As I said, that's the 
um, equity, US equity market with S&P 500. Um, so very strong returns, um, but also higher than average um, in terms of what we expect for equity markets uh, to perform in, over the long run. And this is partly because, as Toby mentioned, we're seeing AI is very topical at the moment. Um, so we're seeing this AI boom, um, mostly driven by a small uh, uh, group of tech firms. But at the same time, bond markets haven't necessarily performed as well as expected. Coming into this year, we expected uh, bonds to perform, but that hasn't actually translated into reality. Um, so the strong performance of equity has really compressed the equity risk premium. So what does this mean? Essentially, the equity risk premium just measures the compensation for the extra risk um, that you take when you invest in equity compared to a less risky asset such as fixed income. So you can see on the graph here on the left hand side, this is showing you the equity risk premium for S&P 500 versus if you invest in um, uh, the US Treasury. Um, so that's just a US government bond. So you can see this is drifting down to zero, simply because equities have become very expensive right now. And this really dampens the views on equity. We, we don't really see double or expect double digit returns in the next 12 months. So our CIO, uh, which publishes research, um, doesn't really expect these returns. Um, and if you look at the broad diversified indices across different regions, such as US and Europe, um, they're expecting around 5% returns in the next 12 months, um, which is similar to what you get right now from money markets, um, or if you look at sterling corporate bonds at the moment as well. So all of this put together is just showing how expensive equities is right now. And alongside that, we have some major events coming up this year. We've got some political events. We've got the UK elections next year, next month. Uh, we have the US elections coming up in November as well. And typically what you see leading up to elections is increased volatility. Um, so that's on the right hand side. You can see um, US equities. Uh, this is the volatility of the uh, returns for S&P 500 uh, leading up to November, which is the US election month. You can see that the, the volatility actually increases up until that election month. So all of these combined really shows that um, equities are really expensive right now. And in these instances, it's a good time to look at lower risk um, investment options, such as bonds and rates. So if we look onto the next slide, this is just showing exactly those options. So for a long time, people have turned to equities simply because bonds were not yielding much. You could not get the returns that you wanted from bonds, so you had to turn to equity. Um, so this picture is very different right now, um, but why is it different? So if we look at what's happened to interest rates, um, particularly over the last couple of years, we can see from uh, end of 2021 to 2022, the massive interest rate spikes. Um, so that's the first chart on this, on this slide on the left. Um, we went through the multiple interest rate uh, hiking cycle simply because uh, central bank, the Bank of England, and other central banks were trying to keep up with inflation. So that led to the interest rate increasing. Now we have the um, Bank of England rate at 5.25%. So now we've got these high rates, how do we access them? So there are different options in terms of accessing these rates, um, and there's many different rates that are typically tied up to this uh, Bank of England interest rate. So a typical example would be um, your instant access for your current account. So and that's the chart in the middle here. You can see on average, your instant access um, uh, interest is around 2.7%, which is the line in, or in the orange. Or you have your ISA. So one year fixed ISA, for example, would typically have higher interest uh, because you're fixing it for a longer period. Um, and other options would also be um, money uh, market determined rates, such as Sonia. So this is just a short term rate in which banks borrow from each other um, overnight. So this is currently yielding at 5.2%. Um, and typically it's much more responsive to interest rate hikes from the, from the Bank of England than it is compared to your current accounts. There's also other sources of, in, of income which UK investors can access, such as equity markets. So that's the charts on the right-hand side. Um, so if you're looking at equity, you can look at dividend yield, which is around 4%, or you can look at the corporate bond market. Um, so GBP corporate is yielding at 5.5%. Um, but Sonia rate, the overnight rate, is still quite attractive in comparison, simply because all of these options have very different risk profiles. Um, so uh, Sonia is eliminating that corporate risk that you get 
um, from the corporate bonds, um, the equity risk that you have from the equity market, um, and it's still yielding very attractive 5.2%. Uh, uh, that's its level. You can also look at, um, so in these kind of times, you can look at more safe haven allocations as well. Um, so that's the next slide. Um, so what this means is, um, yeah, so safe haven allocations, which are for government bonds. Um, so UK, uh, UK government bonds, which we look at called GILTs. So you can access these UK bonds at different maturities. Um, so you can get a one-year maturity, a 10-year maturity, and so on. And typically, each of these maturities will give you a different yield. In usual times, the longer the maturity is, the higher yield you get, simply because the longer you hold something for, uh, the higher risk um, it is. Uh, but that's not what you see here. So the yield curve currently is a very unconventional shape. Um, it's currently what we call inverted. Um, so what that results in is the shorter end of the uh, um, maturity is actually the highest point of the yield curve, um, which makes it very interesting time uh, right now to be on the shorter end. And Sonia, there, the blue dot um, at the very front end, so that's the shortest end at one day maturity, is currently the highest point at 5.2. So all of these combined is, is making, um, making uh, short-term rates cash very attractive. And that's because, we, as we mentioned, um, interest rates are quite high at the moment. But how long can they be high for? Um, when, what are the expectations? We know that interest rates can't stay high forever. So on the next slide, we have a look at the expectations. So if we were asked this question at the end of last year or the beginning of this year, the market expected much more cuts to come. Um, so that's this, the chart on the left-hand side. The market was expecting around seven cuts, um, but the sentiment has changed. Um, right now, uh, we have two cuts priced in, um, and this is just showing that we have an environment that it's what we call higher for longer. So we're expecting rates to be higher for longer. Um, and simply what this means is that the front end, the short end of the curve, uh, the overnight rates will be more attractive for longer, simply because we're expecting rates to remain higher for longer. Um, and the right-hand side chart is just illustrating that the first rate uh, cut is expected in November. So much later than what we expected going into this year. So it just shows you that the very front end, very short end of the curve is very attractive. So all of these combined, equity being expensive, expected volatility um, for the rest of the year, um, rates being up, um, higher for longer, yield curves being inverted, really paint a great picture for cash at the moment. I just on that, Neen, can I just jump in with a question really quickly? I'm not sure whether this is better for you or for Toby, um, but how are you seeing investors positioning at the moment now that cash is more appealing, as you've been talking about? Uh, are they people holding more in cash-like products or still preferring the traditional equities and bonds? Actually, if we could move to the next slide, I think this covers this point quite nicely. Basically, what, what's been particularly evident um, if we look over the last... 18 years or so, there's been a surge in interest into money market funds. Um, so when we came out of the global financial crisis, you know, 2008, 2009, we, we basically entered a decade of ultra low interest rates, even negative interest rates in Europe. Um, and the Bank of England from 2009 to 2022, we basically saw rates below 1%. It wasn't until... I think um, the end of 21, we saw the first hike. Um, and 2021, we saw a return into inflation. Um, we were coming out of the pandemic, a lot of pent up demand, supply shortages, and the economy was basically reopened. With that, we saw interest rates begin to move fairly quickly. Um, and by the end of 2022, rates had gone from below 1% in 21 to 3.5%. And investors have followed the, you know, followed the rates as they've moved higher. They've flocked to money market products. And you can see, you know, back in 2009, money market at year M was around so 3.5 trillion um, to now around 6 trillion. So a huge move. And I think the mantra that cash is king. Um, it's certainly held true that investors have been 
boosting their cash allocation um, to capitalize on these, these rising interest rates. Um, and we've seen money being pulled from current accounts because banks themselves often been pretty slow in terms of passing on these, these rates to their customers. Um, and so often where investors have, have been looking is actually for, for money market funds or money market fund equivalents to actually capitalize on these more attractive invest, uh, interest rates. Um, and a lot of them, you know, when looking at across asset classes, equities, fixed income, many have seen actually cash is probably the most attractive place to, to be positioned. And certainly when we, we think about today, Andy, with the Bank of, the Bank of England rate at five and a quarter percent, um, at a 15-year high, that's, that's, that's a pretty attractive rate of return. I think probably most equity managers would be pretty happy to hit. So after many years of, of close to net you know, uh, zero interest rates, it's not surprisingly that we've, we've seen a big, um, I guess, momentum shift into cash and, and money market type funds. And actually, if we, if we move on to the, to the next slide, um, it's a bit of a busy slide, but basically it shows European uh, investor ETF positioning. So what have they been buying over the last 12 months? Um, and we can see the far right. Um, it's probably no surprise that US equities playing the top slot. Um, certainly one of the best performing equity markets that we've seen in the last 12 months, driven, as many of you will know, by a small concentration of, of stocks, the Magnificent Seven, the Grade Eight, whatever you want to call it. Um, but if we look at the overall picture, so of the 60 billion of net new assets that's gone into ETFs in the last 12 months amongst European uh, usage funds, around 40% has gone into fixed income. Um, and that's on the back of what Hanin was saying, just more attractive yields that we're seeing in the market. Interesting to look at gold, actually, because Gold's been on a bit of a tear, uh, but actually, although gold prices are all-time highs, we've actually seen outflows come out. So this suggests profit-taking, but also the fact that the opportunity cost of holding gold because it doesn't yield anything is quite high. And then if you cast your eyes to the middle, um, that's, I think, a really interesting point in terms of the flows that we're seeing into um, your cash style ETF products. More than 10% of flows this year have gone into Euro um, overnight cash ETFs. So for those investors um, wanting to, to park their cash somewhere, perhaps concerned about stretched valuations in equity markets, a potential market correction, um, and rates staying, staying higher for, for longer, have seen uh, cash ETFs as a, an attractive place to, to be positioned. And speaking of those rates staying higher for longer, we've mentioned Sonia a couple of times, we've mentioned overnight rates a couple of times, but it might be worth going through what exactly overnight rates are, how they work, that kind of thing. Um, and then maybe a bit of an explainer about how the ETFs are constructed so they can actually track the overnight rate. I think that might be quite helpful. Yeah, of course. Um... So essentially, we've spoken about, as we said, Sonia quite a few times. Um, the next slide actually shows quite a good uh, overview of what Sonia actually is, but I'll walk you through it. Um, so essentially, Sonia is just the overnight rate, as we uh, mentioned a few times. Um, so it's the rate at which banks borrow from each other overnight. And it's calculated as the weighted average rate of all the unsecured uh, selling transactions um, that happen overnight. Essentially, the Bank of England um, takes its rate, uh, takes all this data from the banks um, that borrow from each other from the night before um, till 7, uh, 7 a.m. and then publishes this rate at 9 a.m. daily. Um, so it's a daily rate, as we mentioned. Um, so essentially, it's the, um, the reference rate in the UK. Some of you may have heard of LIBOR. Um, so we transitioned to Sonia from 2021. Uh, when LIBOR stopped publishing. So that was, uh, so Sonia is our current uh, money market reference rate in the UK. Um, as mentioned, it's an overnight rate. So it's a short term rate of one day. Um, and it really is the risk free rate um, in the UK. So there's a few differences between Sonia and, and LIBOR. 
but just a bit of background on Sonia itself. Um, it was introduced in, in 1997. Um, the Bank of England took responsibility of it in 2016. There was a bit of reform um, with Sonia in 2018, um, just so that it complied with international best practices for financial benchmarks. Um, but yeah, essentially, it's the Bank of England that published this, this uh, on a uh, daily basis at 9 a.m. Um, it's based on, um, it's transaction based. So comparing it to LIBOR, which was based on a panel bank submissions, uh, uh, whereas Sonia is based on actual transactions. And that's the key difference here. Um, and it has a liquid underlying, um, whereas, uh, Sonia, uh, whereas uh, LIBOR lacks the active underlying market. Um, and it's a near risk-free rate. So it has uh, doesn't really contain any material risk um, in terms of term risk and uh, bank uh, credit risk, whereas LIBOR contained the bank credit risk, which just means that it's less volatile, it's more stable, um, and it's particularly less volatile um, when there's market stress as well. Um, so it's just an overnight rate, which banks borrow from each other overnight, um, and that's how we get the rate. Um, and if we go to the next slide, this is how it translates into an ETF. So an ETF is just essentially trying to replicate an underlying index. And this underlying index um, essentially is just re reflect reflecting a daily roll deposit, which is earning the Sonia rate. Um, so essentially the index is the compound is compounded daily um, with the Sonia rate. Um, essentially that just means it's reinvested on a 365 day uh, basis per year convention. Um, and it's just this, this on your rate. And the way it does this is through a total return swap. Now, what total return swap is, is essentially just an agreement with the swap counterparty. So the ETF delivers the cash overnight uh, rates um, as, as part of the agreement. The swap counterparty is the one that delivers the overnight rate daily to the ETF. So all that the ETF yields is the current overnight rates minus the fee of the ETF. So in summary, the ETF is just giving you the overnight rate, which is compounded daily. Um, I know that the swap might sound a bit complicated, but it's really quite straightforward in terms of what you're actually getting from, from the ETF. Um, the next slide might help illustrate this a little bit um, in terms of the what the index is doing. So the index is the line on the uh, the blue line here. So essentially, it's just showing that the index is a daily a daily compounding of the Sonia rate. So all that means is that what you get is um, the line will always be upward sloping in terms of the returns that you get from the um, the index. So the index level will always be upward sloping. This means that if the Bank of Interest uh, Bank of England interest rate increases. The Sonia line also moves in line with the Bank of uh, England interest rate because it's tied to it. Um, and then the compounding of the Sonia um, of the Sonia index becomes stronger. So the slope becomes steeper. So this slope will always be upward sloping. You don't have any price risk like you do with uh, a bond, for example. The only thing that happens if you get a price cut, the slope becomes uh, becomes less steep. The only point at which it will ever become downward sloping as if the Bank of England interest rate becomes negative. Um, but there's no price risk here. Um, and that's the key thing to note here. It's just a compounding rate and it will always be upward sloping. And it's essentially just giving you the Sonia rate, which is tied to the Bank of England interest rate. So it sounds like a really good solution for ultra low risk investors, right? Kind of akin to putting your cash in a bank. It's that very gradually upward sloping line there the Sonia index that really is attractive for people that are looking for low volatility um, investments uh, but I think the thing that a lot of people on the webinar will be wondering by this point is okay this all sounds great but how do they invest in these so maybe just before we wrap up uh, the main part of the presentation could you um, either um, Toby um, touch on the e what ETS you've got um, which clients are able to access to track the Sonia rate if you could move on to the next slide. Uh, so we just run through this very quickly, but effectively um, this just explains the key differences between an ETF, a money market fund, and just a, a banker or custody account. 
So the ETF obviously trades on exchange um, and delivers a return linked to the overnight rate. The money market fund is effectively a regulated mutual fund that invests in liquid instruments, commercial deposits, and short-term debt. Interestingly, and I think this is a key feature, is, is the yield difference, right? So if you look at instant access accounts at the moment, most banks are offering somewhere in the region of 25 to 3%. I mean, if you go on Martin Lewis's Money Saving Expert, yes, there are definitely other banks offering more attractive rates. A lot of these are quite conditional on having a minimum investment amount or even a maximum investment amount um, or even a fixed term as well. Whereas the yield you see across uh, overnight ETFs and money markets are fairly similar, both offering kind of Sonia um, our, or the money market Sonia plus a small spread depending on the risk profile. In terms of how you trade the money market funds, you trade directly or transact directly with a fund provider via platform. You have a daily price um, which is set by the fund. But the ETF, the pricing is done uh, on exchange by a market maker and you invest by a platform such as our good friends at Invest Engine. Liquidity, now this is the key thing as well. Um, with the money market fund, you normally have daily liquidity. There's a fixed cutoff point every day. Um, there's no minimum or maximum amount that you can invest. Also, some share classes may be um, larger sort of minimum size than others. ETF, um, you absolutely, you can buy as little as one share. So there's no minimum investment amount, no maximum investment amount. And you can buy and sell these uh, shares at any point during exchange hours. Um, and then finally, risk. Now, I think this is a key point to stress. So obviously, with a bank deposit, you're protected under the financial service compensation scheme up to 85000 With a money market fund, you are invested in unsecured securities, so they're not insured or guaranteed. And with an ETF, um, it, it's similar, but you, with the derivative structure, there is counterparty risk, which Neen was talking about. So that's something to, to be mindful of, although there's certain safeguards that are in place um, by having kind of fully collateralized basket of securities and the swap counterparty themselves has to post very variation margin, which basically eliminates uh, mark to market risk. Now, in terms of our product offering, if we could just move to the, the final slide. Yeah, we have three overnight ETFs um, basically offering kind of central bank rates across GB uh, dollars and euros around eight and a half billion across the range, all priced at the same level of 10 basis points. Uh, most interesting, I guess, for the uh, investors on the call would be our sterling overnight product. Current yield is 5.2%. There's a 10-bit management fee, as I mentioned. So your expected return is 5.1%. It's listed on the LSE uh, and yeah, it can be accessed uh, through Invest Engine. Okay, thank you, Toby. Thank you, Neen. That was a really good deep dive into why we should all be considering investing in an overnight fund. Um, we are coming towards the end of the webinar now, uh, and I'm just conscious uh, of time. We're actually doing pretty well. Um, so I'll do a quick demo in a second. Um, but in the meantime, please do feel free, keep the questions coming. Um, if we don't get a chance to answer your question today, then we'll do our best to get back to you after the webinar. We do a copy and paste of all the questions. Um, so with that, I'm sure everybody will be thinking that Investing in overnight fund is very compelling. Um, so I will just now share my screen uh, and hopefully if all goes well, oh, I should be able to, there we go. Bear with me, share screen two, do a little bit of a walkthrough about how to buy these on the Invest Engine platform. Um, right, you should be seeing my screen now. Is that good, Toby? Can you see what I'm sharing? Yep. Perfect, right. Um, so here we've got a dummy account to walk through. Um, so once you're logged into the uh, the platform or the app on your phone or the web browser, you can either open a new portfolio or select your existing one. Um, I've got a DIY one here that I use for demos, which has got half in equities, half in bonds as target weights. Um, so we're just going to load that one up. We can see the current investments down here. And all we do, we go add securities. Wait for it to load. And then here we go. We've got a nice... X trackers banner up here. So we just click that tile and that takes us into the X trackers range. You can see that they've got a lovely long range of good low cost ETFs on here. Um, the one we've been talking about today is the Sterling overnight rate swap ETF, which conveniently is nice and up at the top here. 
Now, one thing that is worth mentioning, you can see uh, from the graph that it looks a bit spiky, uh, which might be surprising to some people, uh, but that's just because it pays a dividend. It's very simple. Uh, so every time it pays a dividend, uh, you as the ETF holder receive some cash in your portfolio and the ETF falls by the amount that was paid out to you in cash, which is just how all dividend paying stocks and ETFs work. Um, so you can reinvest that cash right back into the ETF if you want to. Um, now we're working, Invest Engine are working on getting a, a total return functionality for the graphs added. So you can see that on a total return basis, i.e. if you include the dividends, um, it's got no volatility, no volatility at all. Uh, and these spikes just basically disappear and it looks very similar to the graphs that we were looking at before. Um, and you can check that uh, by going onto the Xtrackers website, which I have just done here. Um, and if you filter for a five-year performance, you should be able to see uh, if my internet holds up that, yeah, here we go. Um, it, it wasn't doing very much when interest rates were low, um, but it's got a nice smooth upward sloping graph as you'd expect. And the performance over the last five years has picked up recently um, because overnight rates have started going up uh, and the performance has picked up. So we go back to our portfolio. We click add to portfolio. Now you can see it's up here on the right. Uh, we click continue. And here's where we adjust the target weights in the portfolio. I'm just going to stick half in there and remove this one. Review and continue. We can see whether this changes the exposure. This is more for the equity funds, but you can see how equity fund changes will change your regional sector and your holding um, composition in the portfolio. So we will just save and continue there. And target weights are all updated. And we should be able to see now down in the portfolio that we have a 50% target weight allocated to XSTR, which is the ETF that we've been talking about. Um, it is as simple as that. All we need to do now, um, if we didn't have a portfolio that's funded, is to fund it through either the invest button here, uh, or you can set up a savings plan, um, which allows you to invest on a regular basis. You can invest weekly or fortnightly uh, or monthly. It's totally up to you. Uh, and it really is as easy as that. Uh, so that kind of wraps up the main part of the presentation. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Um, and we have got about 10 minutes-ish to go through some questions. So I'm just going to load up the Q&A chat um, and I'll fire some off to you and see what we've got. Uh, okay, so first question, uh, why is the ETF swap based? Um, I think we've had a pretty good primer um, of what swap based versus physical replication is, um, but maybe the rationale for why it's swap-based. Yeah, I can take that one. Um, I mean, essentially, in, in simple terms, the Sonya index is not a directly investable index. Um, unlike a physical bond fund or like a bond index where you can actually buy the underlying constituents or even an equity fund where you can buy the underlying stocks, you can't actually physically buy the Sonya index is only accessible through a derivative structure. Mm -hmm. So that's why effectively we enter into a swap contract with the swap counterparty, which is Deutsche Bank in this case, and they effectively agree us to pay the performance of the index. That makes sense. Um, we've got one here, a okay, fairly simple question. Why should somebody consider an overnight fund versus a current account? What are the benefits? I mean, we touched upon those um, early on in the slide as well in terms of the benefits versus a, a current account. Um, and you can see in one of the slides where um, you can see how closely Sonia is aligned to the Bank of in uh, England interest rates. Um, and you saw that the average um, instant access account is around 2.7% in the UK. Um, ISA might be slightly higher. Um, there are there are higher um interest rates that you can get from certain accounts. But typically, Sonia is the very low risk option and it is moves very much in line with the Bank of England interest rates. Um, so you are getting um, the benefits passed on fairly, fairly quickly compared to the current account, which um, tends to be delayed in reflecting the, in, uh, the interest rate changes from the Bank of England. Um, but yeah, it translates much faster into Sonia almost uh, instantaneously compared to your current account. So you're always going to get um, very closely aligned to the Bank of England um, rates compared to your current account. Um, and I mean, if you just compare it to the average rate that you can get in the UK, um, it is much higher at 5.2% versus the average 2.7%. Uh, I think the other key point as well, 
you know, as, as we mentioned, that there are some attractive rates being offered out there. But a lot of these, you're either fixed in terms of there's a, a minimum investment size you need to meet or there's a ma maximum amount that you need to meet. Whereas an mm. ETF, you know, you can buy as, as little as one share. Uh, and also the, the time period as well, right? You're not locked into a fixed term. So if, suddenly, if whatever region of circumstances change in that you need access to this cash straight away, you can sell the ETF at any point. Whereas, again, some of the more attractive rates on offer may lock you into six months or 12 months or even longer. Yeah, and just to add my own two cents, I personally like using money market funds because you know that you're going to always be getting the best rate, right? With bank accounts, there's always such a faff with constantly doing the comparisons on like Martin Lewis, you mentioned before, trying to get the best rate here or the best rate there. It's always changing. You get these introductory fees, which make things super complicated. But if you just buy a money market fund because it's so closely correlated with the overnight rate, it just removes all of that hassle, all that faff. You know you're going to be getting the best rate and the banks aren't going to be able to beat it. So I think it's a really low cost, hassle free option. Um, right. OK, let me just pick out another question. Um, what are the differences? Okay, that's quite a good question. What are the differences between uh, this ETF and some of the, the competitors out there? What's kind of what's the USP? I think some of the biggest differences, um, or one of the biggest differences, actually, is in terms of the risk acceptance in the setup. Um, we're very stringent in terms of how we approach uh, how we approach our setup for this. Um, for example, in our in our swap structure, in terms of the collateral that we have. We only, uh, for this, it's only fixed income. Um, so, and even in the fixed income collateral that we have, we're still very strict in terms of what type of uh, fixed income, uh, so bonds that we invest in, uh, uh, that we have for our collateral. Um, there are other ways that you can look at maximizing returns. There are two things that you can do. Um, you can have equity collateral, which we know equity is higher risk, um, or you can maybe do some lending of your collateral. Um, but typically for, for us, um, we don't want to really engage in these kind of activities for a rate that's supposed to be, you know, risk-free uh, or near risk-free um, or increasing the risk for a product like this doesn't necessarily um, align with the, um, with, with kind of what Sonia is trying to do. Um, so for us, in terms of our product, it's um, low risk in terms of uh, comparing it to other products out there in the market. We're very strict in terms of the collateral that we have and the risk acceptance that we have in our setup in general. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I've got a question that I think I can answer here. It's about my demo. Um, someone's asking um, if instead of replacing a bond fund with your fund, I can just add the Sonia fund to the portfolio. And yes, that is very easy to do. You just, in the same way that I did, you go add securities and then you just tweak the target weights. So if you want to add, say, 25% to the Sonia funds, you put 25% in the box and then reduce your other ETF by 25%. It's pretty simple. Um, and the second part of their question is, can this be kept inside NICER? And the answer is yes. So all of your income and capital gains will be tax-free if you hold it inside NICER. Um, quest quick question for uh, one of you, not sure which, which one of you knows this the top of your head. Uh, when is the dividend paid? How often is the uh, does this ETF distribute it's a dividend? Semi, semi annual dividend, so it should be, yeah. There we go. Okay, uh, we've got a question here about interest rates. What happens when interest rates drop? Um, I think, Hanin, you answered this one pretty well as part of the presentation, right? Um, yeah. the line will just kind of flat line if interest rates go closer to zero and you won't actually lose any money it should be the the rate that you're accumulating money will decrease uh regarding the risks toby this might be one for you given that we we're talking about fscs before um what's the risk of not getting our investments back if x truckers goes bust um or is the risk in the money market fund yeah good question so with i mean uh, um all etfs under usage guidelines um, the assets are, are ring fenced. So I guess if you think about, you have two elements of risk when investing in an ETF. One, the ETF provider goes bust, in which case your assets are ring fenced uh, and safeguarded. And then with a the synthetic product, in terms of on the other side, the actual swap counterparty. And there are a number of measures in place there to safeguard your assets. One is having a actual uh, physical basket of securities collateral basket of securities and it's collateralized on a daily basis. So 
if that swap counterparty is not able to meet their obligations to actually default on the swap, you actually have the fund has full control over those securities that can be liquidated and return the assets back to the investor. And then in terms of the managing sort of ongoing day-to-day -day risk, that's uh, where I mentioned that we also have the intraday variation margin, which is something that's put in place by the regulator. Um, and again, there are very, very tight um, stringent guidelines to basically ensure you have kind of zero intraday mark-to-market uh, -market exposure versus that swap counterpart. Yeah, that makes sense. We've got a couple of questions. I think there might be a bit of confusion about the returns. So we, we've kind of been throwing around 5.2%. Um, over what time period can investors expect that 5.2% to materialize? So essentially what the index is doing is giving you the um, that 5.2% interest um, on the deposit and its role. It's compounded, essentially. Um, so you're not getting it over a certain period. This 5.2% um, is just the overnight rate that we have at the moment. Um, so this won't necessarily be 5.2%, um, I don't know, in two days time. It's just what you have right now. So it's a daily compounding in the index. Um, so essentially it's um, being reinvested for that rate at 5.2%. Um, but that 5.2%, as I said, is a daily rate, it can change. Um, but the, you will always be upward sloping, as you explained already. Um, and at the only point, um, if interest rates were cut and say it's no longer 5.2% and it's 5%, you'll just get a less strong compounding um, and the steepness of the curve will just flatten out. Um, I hope that, that explains it a bit better. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's very clear. Um... So another question, this is more from me than the chat, but how are you seeing clients use money market funds in portfolios? Are they using it as kind of short-term tactical place to park cash um, or are they seeing it as a kind of larger allocation now that the rates are so high, it deserves more of a, a larger chunk in portfolios? Yeah, I mean, we saw um, we saw a lot of allocation to cash products. I mean, you saw that slide with the big bubbles um, mm. in terms of what we're seeing European investors doing um, to cash products. Um, particularly um, at the start of last year and even going on to this year in terms of um, having a large allocation to cash simply because it is yielding 5.2% as we said compared to um, compared to your other higher risk pro uh, products. Um, so if you're increasing your duration, um, so this is an overnight rate product. Um, if you're holding something for longer, um, you know, it's balancing risk and returns. Um, and we're seeing some, uh, a lot of investors allocating to the very short end of the curve, which includes cash products. And um, so we're seeing uh, a lot of inflows into cash. Uh, maybe, uh, Toby, you can add some, some further. Yeah, you know, I think as well, um, people are allocating just as a insurance in their, in their portfolio. So given where equity markets are at the moment, um, certainly in the U.S., valuations look fairly stretched um, and there is a risk potentially going into elections at the end of the year that we do see some volatility. So we are seeing some investors beginning to scale back their equity exposure a little bit and increase their cash um, allocation. And with the yields around 5%, um, that's kind of a, an attractive return that I think most investors are willing to take. And then also some who are just using it as a place between making different investments, right? So when they're pausing in terms of maybe switching between, I don't know, US equities back to the UK, just giving them time to take a breath, park the money in, in, in an overnight product or, you know, a few weeks, a few months, whatever, um, mm -hmm. just as a kind of an interim stopgap solution as well. I yeah. think it's been a fairly popular option. Yeah, so we've got a few questions in here um, just on tax and ISAs and all that sort of stuff, um, and also on liquidity. Um, so I'll cover off those quickly. These can be held in an ISA, just to reiterate. So no income or capital gains tax if they're held within your tax wrapper. Um, in terms of liquidity, you can sell out whenever you want. As Toby mentioned, there's no lock-in periods. Um, we have a daily trading window. Um, the ETF will take a couple of days to settle, um, but it's certainly not like a fixed-term deposit where you have to lock your cash in for a certain period of time. Um, so if, you have, if you're just saving for the short term, then it's a really good place just to park your cash. Um, and with that, we are now at 5.45. There are quite a few questions that we haven't managed to get to. Um, uh, so 
Rich, who's behind the scenes, if you wouldn't mind copying and pasting all the questions, um, we'll take a note of them and get back to you um, over the next few days. Uh, so I think all that's left uh, for me to say is that if you want to find out more uh, about the X-Trackers ETF that we mentioned today or any of the other X-Trackers ETFs that are available on the platform, um, just click the X-Trackers banner at the top of our ETF range page, as you saw me do as part of the demo, um, and you'll find all the details there. Uh, so thank you, Toby. Thank you, Hanine. Thank you, everybody, for joining uh, and see you next time.